This is Frankie Benali from Quiet Ride at the premiere of Where Now You're Here, There's No Way Back, the Quiet Ride movie at the Newport Beach Film Festival. And this festival rocks. This is a Blaring Out with Eric Blair show at the 2014 Newport Beach Film Festival with Quiet Riot drummer Frankie Benelli celebrating the premiere of the Quiet Riot movie. Well, now you're here, there's no way back. What possessed you to want to make this film? I think just looking back at the history of the band after losing Kevin, and uh, there's a 30 plus year history, and it was you know a really great story that I happen to live. Um, and um, Regina Russell, the uh, director and producer of the film, was the one that really prompted me to go ahead and, and do it. So here we are. How much of this film centers on the band as a whole and your experience alone with the band? Um, it covers all those aspects. It covers the history of the band. Um, you know, it touches on, on the late great Randy Rhodes um, and all through the passing of uh, our lead singer Kevin DeBruyne in 2007 and then beyond that to real time. Kevin, before his death, was there any sign that there was any kind of drug abuse issues or anything like that? No, none whatsoever. As a matter of fact, um, you know, when I'm asked that question, you know, we could be out on the road on, on a summer package tour on a tour bus for two, three months, and when you're doing that, you know if somebody's using. And never, um, never any indication um, was there any of that on the road, never saw it. So he was not um, using on the road. I think when he went to Las Vegas, where he was out of my sphere of influence, and when he was you know, left to his own devices, that's when it was going on. But he kept it, he kept it very, very underground because I was his best friend. I'm still his best friend. And I didn't know it came as a complete shock to me. Does this film delve into that a lot? Um, it, it's a very honest film, and it, and it you know, touches um, all aspects of what is happening in Quiet Riot, including that. What about your comeback in Quiet Riot? You went through a hard time, and it was, it was hard to rebuild a band that was so established. Yeah, well, I mean, for three years, I didn't pick up a pair of drumsticks. I, I did absolutely nothing, because I could not imagine um, life in Quiet Ride without Kevin. Um, and I generally had no intentions of, of going ahead and doing it again because how could you do it without Kevin Dubrow? But the whole idea of Quiet Ride was bigger than, than just Kevin or me or anyone. It was the sum of all the parts. And there are a lot of parts in the history of the band. So um, it was time to continue it. As far as getting Jizzy Pearl to sing for the band in certain interviews. In an interview you did with Blabbermouth, not uh, very recently, I believe, you said that Kevin actually respected Jizzy Pearl as a vocalist. Yeah, and, and you know how that came about, because Kevin and I never really had a discussion about that, but what happened is um, uh, on Metal Sludge, they had done a, uh, a 10 question, you know, a rate 10 singers with Kevin Dubrow. And one of the singers that was on the list for ratings was Jizzy. And Kevin stated that, uh, that he really liked Jizzy, respected him, and he thought he was very intelligent. So that's not coming from me. That's coming from Kevin himself. Now, now Jizzy uh, has been in L.A. Uh, of course, he was in Love, Hate, but, you know, he's, he's fronted L.A. Guns. He's fronted Rat. Uh, and now Rat has, Stephen Piercy apparently, uh, it was announced a few days ago that he's left Rat again. So do you think there's any danger that Jizzy may go back to Rat, or is or are you, is this a permanent situation right now? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's a permanent situation for, for Jizzy. I can't see him going back to do that because I think all the bands that he was doing prior to joining Quiet Riot was um, sort of his... Um, apprenticeship okay. to become uh, a member of Quiet Riot. So we're very, very happy with Jizzy. Very happy. Is it fitting like a glove with audiences? Yeah, the amazing thing about Jizzy is that, you know, you don't replace a singer like Kevin Dubrow. The shoes were just too big. He was the complete package. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable singer, incredible range, unbelievable performer. What we wanted to do is find someone that had the confidence and the skill to be able to step into this kind of situation. And Jizzy has the range, he has the stage persona, but he brings his own um, unique style to Quiet Ride, which is something I welcome. What would you say are a couple highlights from your time in Quiet Riot in the early years? Um, getting the record deal as bad as it was, that was a highlight because uh, you know it was a record deal. Uh -huh. um, so you, you accept the terms that are given to you when there's no other options. Um, 
making that record was a high point because that's something that Kevin and I have wanted to do for a long time. I mean, you have to understand that I started playing with Kevin in 1980. So that's two years before we recorded the Metal Health record, three years before it came out. So this was something that we had been grooming ourselves for two, three years, uh, and we finally got to do it. Um, so doing that record was a highlight. Uh, playing the US Festival was very important because you think about the fact that 11.30 in the morning we were playing to 375,000 people. There, I was there. Yeah, there was no horizon, it was just people. Yeah. And, and we knocked it out of the park that day. Um, we were fortunate enough to, to support a lot of great bands during that period of time. I think in 1983 playing Madison Square Garden was important for me. Uh, because I used to go there when I was a kid with my folks to see the Ringling Brothers. Um, my dad and I would go to see what he called prize fighting in the bloody seats, which were the expensive seats. Um, I saw Led Zeppelin wow. at Madison Square Garden and then to play it, that was important. Playing the LA Forum was important for us in 84 and especially for Kevin because his you know, hometown boy does good. So those are some of them. You know, having a number one record doesn't yeah. doesn't hurt either. Well, and, and also not just having a number one record, but making music history as being the first heavy metal band to ever go number one on the Billboard charts is pretty heavy. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that all the bands that came um, after us for that genre made their success on their own terms, but there is no doubt whatsoever that Quiet Riot were responsible for opening that door and making it possible for them to happen, because if you think of the acts that were above us on the charts at the time. We're talking the police, Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, you know, people like that. There was no rock. There was no rock in the top 40. And we went to number one. So when we did that, I think um, record labels, agents, attorneys, managers, accountants, they all saw that there was money to be made from the genre. And it worked. You were in Dubro first, mm -hmm. correct? So, so Randy was already with Ozzy during that period. So, so how, what was your relationship with Randy like? Well, Randy actually, um, he called me up and wanted um, wanted to know if I wanted to come down and play with Ozzy. Oh, okay. And so, um, and I had a drum set but no car, so he borrowed a car and came over and picked me up. And it was Randy on guitar, myself on drums, Dana Strum, who ended up uh, in Slaughter on bass, and Ozzy singing. Uh, and, and it sounded great, everybody was really happy. Uh, some of those songs that were on the first Ozzy record were born at that rehearsal. But they would only spend the money to send one person over to England to record because they decided to record in England instead of LA. And the choice was obvious, they took Randy. So I knew Randy from that, but also Randy had told Kevin that he should go check me out because I had what he called this big beat. Um, and Kevin actually came down and saw me play with a band called Monarch. And that's how it started. Uh, that was uh, January 1980. Yeah, so I guess Sharon's decision to go with Lee Kerslake and uh, Bob Daisley was because they were in Britain. Yeah, I mean, and, and excellent choices. I mean, Bob Daisley, very talented songwriter and bass player. And, uh, and Lee, I love Lee, he's an old friend. Um, so they were excellent choices and they made a great record. Um, you know, think think about think about it. if I had ended up playing with Ozzy, I I don't I don't know that there would have been a Dubro. Uh, I don't know that the Quiet Ride would have continued. You know, if Dana had ended up in that situation, maybe there would have been a slaughter. So, you know, a lot of things could have been different. You know, if, maybe if I wasn't playing with Kevin, there would have been no Metal Health record. So, what would have happened to the genre? You have a brand mm -hmm. because of what happened, yeah. you know, and that's how life is sometimes. Listen, I have, I have very few regrets in my life. One of them is the loss of Kevin. Um, but I've also been very fortunate, and, uh, and Quiet Ride has been a blessing in many ways. And it continues to be so, you know, 30 plus years down the line. You were one of three drummers to play on Hughes Thrall. How did you get the gig with Hughes, Hughes Thrall? Um, According to what Glenn told me, who was a dear friend, they auditioned about 100 drummers, and I got, I got um, three callbacks. And after the third callback, they gave me the gig. And, and I was thrilled because I was already a big Glenn Hughes fan since 1972 when they released You're the Music with Just the Band and Trapeze. And I was well aware of, um, um, uh, of Pat Thrall's work with Stomo Yamashita's Go and Automatic Man, all those things. So 
uh, I was I was thrilled. But you know, at the same time that I was doing that, I was already in the studio with Billy Idol recording Money Money, uh, and doing a number of other sessions. So, and I had already actually toured extensively with Steppenwolf in 1979. Uh, had played Day on the Green to over 40,000 people with Robert Fleischman. So. You know, I was the new guy, but I was the new guy who came with uh, a decent amount of experience, and I used it to my fullest. How did touring with Wasp and working for Blackie Lawless differ than being in Quiet Riot? Well, it's a different dynamic because you have to remember that even in Dubrow, I was already taking care of the business. Whereas when when you go out with Wasp, it, it was. Um, in a way, it was a, a much easier gig for me because all I had to do was sit behind the drums and play. Um, and Black and I get along great. You know, we have, we've had our ups and downs like all musicians do. Uh, but he and I get along great, and all you have to do is talk about the New York Yankees, and, and all of a sudden, anything that might be disturbing goes away. Uh, but it was great. I mean, it was a, a, a fine-tuned, well-oiled machine working with Wasp, and I really enjoyed it. I only did one tour with them, but it was a world tour. It lasted like a full year. Uh, and, and it was great, and I really enjoyed it, and I've gone on to do, I think, about 10 albums with Wasp over the years. But, in the, but you only did one tour with them? Yeah, I only did the tour for the Headless Children, which was the first record I did, and that was in 1989. And that's considered a great Wasp record, too. Yeah, I think, I think it's a great Wasp record because it's, it's the one record that Blackie did that he didn't um, use the, the gore and the theatrics and all those things as a crutch and actually just let the music do the talking. Blackie doesn't get the, uh, the level of appreciation that I think he should because he's, he's an incredible songwriter. He really, really is. And, uh, and you know, some people criticize him by, because of some of the things that he does, but he does them for a reason and, and he's fully committed to Wasp. Playing drums the way you do is very taxing on a person physically, and being on the road is very taxing on a person physically. So how, what is your health regimen? How do you stay in the pocket? Well, I mean, you know, I've, I've always liked getting exercise, and I try to ride at least, you know, um, four days a week, and that's 40 miles that I do a week if I can, when schedules allow. Um, and, uh, and Regina, God bless her, got me to stop being a carnivore, which I was, you know, my entire life. So I've been a vegetarian for over a year now, and uh, and you know that helps. Um, you know, I don't I don't do drugs. Um, I don't drink to excess. You know, if I go have sushi, I have sake. If I go to a nice dinner, I have a you know glass of wine. Um, but if you're going to stay in in the game for the long haul and compete with the kids, then uh, you better stay in shape. But I go out there and I play every night like like it was, like I was 18. As rock stars, you have women throwing themselves at you all the time. How do you deal with those kind of temptations? Well, you know, my policy is that that if you know that there's there's a, a certain girl out there that would love to be with you, that's all I need to have. I don't need to actually do it. It's just the idea that you know you could do it. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, I, I don't have time for that. I really, really don't. I don't. It's, you know, there's too many games and, and I don't play games. Yeah. Tell me about your uh, relationship with Regina Russell and, and how it, this movie came to be made. Um, well, Regina actually, we actually met in 1983 and uh, we were playing, we were playing in, uh, in the town that she was living in at the time. And, um, and, you know, she was very cute, but she was very young. And I said, uh-uh, you know what I mean? Um, and then we lost touch from 83 until uh, uh, 2009. And we ran into each other at a Whole Foods <laughs> uh, market. And we started talking, and uh, it just kind of picked up from there. At what point was it like, we need to make this film? I think it was about a year later, a little bit less than a year later, when, when I started, you know, considering the possibilities of doing it again and I started going through the footage and all of that um, and you know she said you know you should really make a movie of this it's a great story and it started from there now I realize that going through archives sometimes can be very distracting and and take you back in a place where you were 20 30 years ago where you start reminiscing and you get into maybe thinking wow life was so much better back then I went through all of it because I you know that's the kind of person I am that's the kind of a type personality I have um, and I had equal portions of ridiculous laughter and and ridiculous sadness um, but as far as making the film is concerned um, I know that I'm too close to it to 
dictate it. So I didn't. I let her make the movie she wanted to make. You know, based on based on the material, the archive material I have, and and then all of the things that were happening in real time. Um, I didn't interfere in any way whatsoever. I mean, there, there were times when when I, I was very unhappy about some of the things, but I also know that for the story to be true and real, you have to include not just the good times, but you have to include some of the some of the less glamorous times. There's, there's a lot of the live footage that I came across that it was like, wow, that, that's pretty amazing and, and how tight we were. But you know, we, we never had egos about ourselves, but we also knew our own worth. Um, so when I look back and I say, man, we were really tight, it, it, back then I thought we were really tight. So that wasn't surprising. Some of the surprising things were non-performance stuff, you know, vacations and being in the studio and hanging out um, and even how the film opens. That piece of footage that we have on there, that revelation was, was pretty amazing because it was like, oh my God, I can't believe I have this. And it ends up being the opening piece in the film. So why should people see this film? I think if they want to get a clear picture of, of how things were for Quiet Riot and both the good and the bad and how things are for Quiet Riot, then, then you get a really good cross section, because you know some some rock and roll movies are just about the great times. Mm. You know, some people just want to show the good times and the success, uh, and they don't want to show the sometimes downward spiral and some of the things that happen in in life, because it's a movie about life. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if they want to see an honest portrayal of of what it's like to be in a rock and roll band from that genre and what it is to be in that band three decades later, uh, then that's what you're going to get. What do you think of your contemporaries, Motley Crue, calling it quits? Um, well, first of all, I think, I think Motley are so incredibly lucky to have been able to retain their original lineup, even, even though they took a couple of detours, uh, and that they've been able to keep a level of success. That, that has been astonishing. I mean, when you think about the genre, they've actually outlived um, Van Halen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think that, if, that if they've made enough money where they don't have to worry about it, if they don't enjoy doing it anymore, or if they don't enjoy each other's company, if that is the case, what better time to get out? And then you have an album coming out, a new Quiet Riot record, and apparently, from what I understand, it's part jizzy and then some live, a live concert, one of the last live concerts that Kevin did with Quiet Riot. Tell me about this. Yeah, that is correct. Um, uh, myself and, and my songwriting partner, Paul Sabu, we wrote the material, and we went to the studio, and out of the ten things that I was happy with, I narrowed it down to six. And it occurred to me that... I was never going to be able to go into the studio with Kevin again. And this would be the first record since Kevin died that obviously he wouldn't be on. And I said, no, while I can't change what happened to Kevin, I can at least make him part of this release. And, uh, and so I decided to put four, four songs we did live. And they're not the four songs that, that people would normally expect. You know, I think, I think if I was having to deal with a traditional label, they would say, okay, you gotta do, come on, feel the noise, bang your head, mama, we're all crazy now, and maybe the wild and the young. Um, and instead, I did four of the songs that Kevin enjoyed playing live more than any of the other ones and and two of them happen to be songs from the last record that that we did with Kevin Rehab that he just loved to play those songs so it's it's an honor of Kevin and in tribute to Kevin that he gets to be on one more quiet ride record what's next for you uh, continue touring um, Next month in May, you know, we've got, we've got shows in Texas, we have shows in Mexico, Las Vegas, Northern California. Um, we've already got dates uh, as far as Colombia and on and on and on. We just, you know, we're talking about other South American dates and of course, the bulk of the tour will be in the U.S. as always. What's, what's the camaraderie like when you go on these, these uh, a lot of the cruise thing is a big deal now and these huge uh, festivals all over the United States and in other countries. When you see your old buddies from the old days, what's it like for you? For me, it's great because you know there, there's no there's no 
animosity, no jealousy or anything, because if you have managed to survive the 90s in a rock band, you know, more power to you. So I think that every time you see, every time you see a band that, uh, from the genre that's still working, regardless of what the lineup is, they're still working, they're still out there, they're still slugging it away, they're still doing their hits. God bless them. I think it's great. So I'm, I'm, I cheer them on all the way, all the way. I don't care who it is. I cheer them on all the way because it's good for the business. It's good for music. It's good for me. Frankie Benelli, thank you for talking to the Blaring Out with Eric Blair yeah, show. This is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show at the 2014 Newport Beach Film Festival with Frankie Benelli signing off. <laughs>